First John chapter number one. We're back to kind of continue our series in uh, the book of First John as we work through that. I have a note here, though. Um, actually, two notes um, that it is Sierra's birthday today. I would not have known that minus the balloons floating in the back of the auditorium. And Sierra, I apologize for your parents. And if you're in counseling in a few years, we understand why. And uh, <laughs> a couple of the birthdays, Monica Jones, singing happy birthday to Monica Jones. Is that true as well? Amen. And then Brandon Hittenmiller and Eddie Cox. There they are. All right. Are they hiding on me? Oh, no, there's one. And then uh, Eddie Cox. You... Okay. All right. Not here. Okay. Well, we'll sing happy birthday in the service. We're glad you're here. And uh, get all the birthdays out of the way. But yeah, those balloons are sitting right there. So if I need something, if I say hello, Kitty, you're going to know why during the service now. Oh, man. Great to be here. Great day at First Baptist Church. So glad you're great to see a family this morning get uh, saved and get baptized today and growing in the Lord. Glad to know that people are growing in Jesus and growing in grace every day of the week. And I hope you are. Whether you've been saved one day or 10 days or 100 days or 20 years, you've got to be growing in grace every single day. It's easy sometimes for a Christian who's been saved to look at a young Christian and say, well, they're not doing this. And you're pointing this way away from God while that new, new Christian's pointing this way towards God. I'd rather be pointed towards God than away from God, no matter where you're at in that, in that lineup. Well, 1 John chapter 1, if you have your Bibles there, uh, John begins in verse number 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. We looked at that portion of Scripture last week, how John begins the, the book of 1 John, and it begins similar to how he begins the Gospel of John, presenting the incarnate Son, Jesus Christ himself. He said, He is the Son, and I'm a reliable and credible witness because I saw him, I heard him, and I touched him. And he said, if you follow the Son, you'll have fellowship with him, and it's not a past tense fellowship, verse number 3, it is a present tense fellowship. In verse number four, he says, In these things, one of the first purposes of 1 John, these things write unto you that your joy may be full. When you have fellowship with Jesus Christ, your life will be full of joy. I mentioned this last week, but it's not just a deep seated happiness. Pastor, I am so full of joy. It is so deep you can't see it. That's not what that word joy means in, that, in this passage right here. That word joy means a smile on your face, a, a jump in your step. It is praise God, look what God is doing. This is amazing to walk with God. That's joy. You can come to church, have a smile on your face. You can leave church with a bigger smile on your face. You can go to work Monday morning with a smile on your face. Why? Because you have fellowship with God and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And John says, if you have this, your joy will be full. If you don't have a lot of joy, check your relationship. It's not God's fault. God didn't stop bringing joy. Maybe you stopped receiving joy. But that was last week. If you missed that message, you can download it on YouTube. Verse number five is tonight. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Tonight, I've entitled the message, Walking in the Light. Not walking toward the light, not walking around the light, not noticing the light, observing the light, but walking in the light. You see, these next, I believe these next five verses, or the next six verses here in the end of 1 John chapter number one, now it's kind of like a, a counseling session for your relationship. There are times that people in their, in their marital relationship or couple relationship go to counseling. Ah, some people think it's, it's useless, and I imagine in the worldly perspective it would be useless. 
There was one story where a wife said to, to the counselor, I was better off before I met you. Well, listen, women, she was just brave enough to say it, probably. <laughs> he went on, the counselor went on, and he cringed when he heard those words because he saw the husband's demeanor. But I wonder, as I observe Christians and observe our lives, if at times, as Christians, we don't seem to say the same thing to the Lord, I was better off before I met you. Because you get saved and, and we get happy, we get that joy, and you see it in a new Christian, and boy, they're excited about serving God, they're excited about coming to church, they're excited about going to church, they're excited about reading the Bible, and then it sets in, right? A little while and there's a bump in the road. We're like, oh man, look how beautiful it is. Come to church tonight, I passed a work van, a boat, people exercising, there's every reason not to come to church. And a new Christian at first, they're like, man, this is great. But after a while, that joy starts to dim. In this section of Scripture, I believe, John brings to us some counseling and says, listen, this is what this relationship is going to look like. This is what it needs to look like. There are some that would say that this fellowship means just salvation. I reject that philosophy. In fact, I was reading an article about that thing, and as I got done, I noticed who'd published the article, and it was from a man at a seminary that I'm aware of, and I thought, no wonder they think that. And he rejects the idea that you should abide in Christ. He rejects the idea that walking with God brings joy and blessing in your life. And I reject his ideas, because I look at this and I see what John, I believe, is trying to bring, and he says, listen, this is supposed to be great. But I want us tonight to look at this concept of walking in the light. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for this time. I ask for your help. Lord, we need you to disseminate and discern this scripture to us, Lord. Your Holy Spirit can do that. And I pray that we would listen and we'd respond to it. Lord, we respond the right way, a way that would please you. Lord, I pray tonight that there's those here who have been Christians maybe a little while or a long while, Lord, maybe need a checkup in our relationship with you that that would be the case tonight. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. John says in verse number four, the purpose of this section is to have joy. He now goes on to describe what that joy looks like, and I can't help but think of, of the wedding that was here yesterday and where Miss Jackie Trogan and Ms., Mr. Eric Turnbull uh, said their vows right up on this stage. If you were here, if you get to watch it sometime, uh, you notice Eric during the vows was kind of choking up, I think. He was kind of cheer, tearing up during those vows. My wife and I, for a number of years, got to do some wedding photography on the side. Often at weddings, the brides would ask us, they said, well, would you capture my, my groom's, uh, the, the face as he walks, as I walk down the aisle, because I think he's going to cry. And ladies, I hate to break it to you, most, most men don't cry when their bride walks down the aisle. All right, it's, it's not a come on, not a whatever, it's just, it just is. But ladies, you saw it in a movie once and you think, well, that'd be so special if he cried. I, I try to break it to ladies this way, I say, well, the truth is most men don't cry when they see a pretty lady and you look beautiful today, so he may just be happy to see you. I hope he cries. Well, he may, I'm sure he will. There are some that cry, Pastor Ryan. How you doing tonight, sir? Is today your wedding anniversary? I thought it was. One year today. Praise the Lord. I don't know why you came into my mind right now. Watch that video. <laughs> I, I shouldn't explain. I shouldn't. I shouldn't. Uh, we want them to stay married. And, uh, but, but this relationship, there's joy there. There's joy when a couple says, I do, and, and they walk off or run off down that aisle. There's joy there. And there's a special, a special kind of connection when a couple gets married. And, and not just, sure, they're married, but, but there's like this, this just sweet, just wonderful, like, it's, just, it's, it's special. And I love it. And that's the way it ought to be with Jesus. And, and now John begins to describe for us what this relationship, some aspects of this relationship 
He says a few things about how it ought to look, and, and people don't like that very much. They don't want sometimes our relationship with God to have any boundaries. They say, well, you're just bringing the law back into, in, into church. It's just called legalism. Well, it's not legalism. It's just that God has some expectations for a relationship with him, just like my wife does for me. You know, she expects me to come home at night. Now, that's weird. She, she expects me not to have any other girlfriends. Right? She expects me not to write love notes to anyone else but to her. Right? Is that unreasonable or is that the way a marriage is supposed to work? It's the way a marriage is supposed to work. Well, I won't talk about this, but James addresses that when he says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. See, there's always expectations on a relationship. I see the first thing, though, in this. I see a recognition of the light. As we walk in light, there is a recognition of the light. In verse number 5, John says this, This, then, is the message. Now, John repeatedly through this epistle, through this letter, and through this book, will say these types of statements. This is the message. This is important. I want you to catch this. This is one of those phrases. This, then, is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. It does not say that God is the light. It does not say that God is a light, but literally that God is light. By definition, God is light. The very first thing that God created was light. Light is foundational to God. This is a foundational concept. Genesis 1, 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Exodus 13, 21, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. Psalm 27, verse 1, the Lord is my light. And I'll help you every time I pause. Guess which word it's going to be? And my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Isaiah 2, 5, O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk. Let us walk in the, oh, see, you already know that verse. Well, walk in the light of the Lord. John 1, 9, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light. Light, that light is every man which cometh into the world. You see, throughout Scripture, we see this concept that God is light. That's what John says. This is the message we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. Well, what does this mean, God is light? Is it like on bugs like that? Oh, you see the light, I just can't get away from it. Ah, oh, and you get zapped by it? Of course not. This light, in a foundational sense, is the source of all holiness, purity, Wisdom and direction. Those are what, that's what those verses describe. Light brings direction. Light is holiness and purity. The very nature of God is one of light, not of darkness. God is light. The very nature of God. I have this thing, which many of you know, for flashlights. You know, because that May 19th in the transition service, Pastor Let gave me another flashlight. Have I used that flashlight? Yes, multiple times, actually. What for? It doesn't matter. Flashlights are just handy things. I have them all over the place, in my house, in my car, in my desk, on my shelves. They're wonderful things. The thing about a flashlight is that it helps you cut the darkness. It helps you identify things that maybe you're looking for. We're going up in a few days to man up camp. I'm going to take some flashlights with me. It'll be dark outside, and I'll use a flashlight to light my path so I can see the way I'm supposed to walk. This afternoon, we used a flashlight to try to find something the boys had lost in a car, looking for a light to find something. You see, the light helps me discover God's will. The light helps me see God's way. The light helps me know what God wants. The light is foundational to my relationship that God is 
light. Not only is it foundational, I see that it's flawless. This verse says, God is light, and in him is no darkness. What is bad about God? The answer, nothing. How could God do this? It's a terrible thing. If it's bad, God didn't do it, because in him there is no darkness. Not at all. That's what the scripture says. You'll have people who are not saved or not close to the Lord. They'll ask this question, how could a good God do this to these people? Because they're good people. Well, who are we to question God? God is light. In him is no darkness. Someone said this, uh, speaking of God, he has all knowledge with no mixture of ignorance on any subject. He is infinitely happy with nothing to make him miserable. He is true, never stating error. He never knows the darkness of disappointment nor adversity. You see, God is light, and by that light it's foundational, but it is flawless. So that if I follow God's light, I can live a life that will please Him. We're going to deal with later on, probably next week, as we looking at rejecting the darkness. But too many, too many Christians want to mix the light with the darkness. God, I, I need your light over here, but, but, I, but then I don't need it over here. I want to put a, 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 a filter right down the middle of this light, and Lord, I'll use you on Sunday, and I'll use you when I come into a trial, and I'll use you when I have a problem, but the rest of the week, let me walk like I want to walk. Let me just stumble around in the darkness. And as we stumble around in the darkness and we stub our toe, spiritually speaking, we then look at God and say, God, why'd you let this happen to me? And God said, but I am light. Not I've given you light, I am light. And if you follow my light, you don't have to stumble around in the darkness. You see, God is light. In him is no darkness at all. Not only is it flawless, but I see that it is factual. Now, I love this, and I hope you catch this about this verse. If you look at me, look with me in verse number five. John says this, that God is light, right? And, and he says that in him is no darkness at all. You say, that's great. You read that verse, Pastor. I get it. All right, but understand what John is saying. All right, it's like he's saying, hey, moron, hey, howl, God is light, and there is no darkness. This is a way that John, the writer, will say certain things to get something across. He says this in John chapter 1, verse 3, speaking of Christ, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Get the same concept? He says it later on in 1 John, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. You see, John does this thing for us right here, and I love this. He says, listen, he goes, God is light, and then just in case you missed it, I'm going to say it the other way so you don't miss it. There's no darkness in him. This is factual. This is the way it is. And this is foundational to your walk with God. You see, I believe that the reason John sets this up is he's now going to set up for us the source and the direction for our relationship. It's God. He gets to determine the direction this relationship is supposed to go. Why is that important? It's important because we often want to dictate our own relationships. Uh, Jesus said to worship God, we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So there are ways to worship the Father. There are ways not to worship that Father. You see this example throughout Scripture. It begins with Cain and Abel. And Abel and Cain both brought sacrifices and an offering to God. One was accepted and one wasn't. Who got to decide? The light got to decide. You'll read throughout the laws of Leviticus, and, and you'll read about the way that God wants it. Who gets to decide? The light gets to decide. I read the verse in Exodus about the pillar uh, that led them and the, and, the cloud, and the pillar of fire. And who got to decide where the children of Israel went in the wilderness? The light. You see, God gets to determine the relationship because he is light. You see, in most of our relationships, there is a, a sense of compromise or back and forth. All right, so in a marriage relationship, my, my wife and I, we, we are trying to strive to put our flesh aside and put the Lord first, and that means we both end up compromising, right? It's the way it's supposed to be. That means it's not always my way, it's not always her way. We try to find the best way, the way God wants us to do it. Sometimes it's what I'm thinking, and sometimes, more often, it's probably what she's thinking. And, and that's the way a, maybe a good marriage is supposed to work. 
But if we're not careful, we take that same concept to the Lord. We say, okay, God, I see what you want over here, and and this is what I want, and and how can we compromise in this? I know I'm praying for this, and I'm praying for this job, and I know you probably want me to do this, and eh, it's okay, but we'll try to find that compromise. Well, that's not the way it works because God is light. You see, that's why this concept is foundational that John brings to us next. We have to capture this. We have to understand it, that God is light. That means I go to his word because his word is light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So if I'm not in the word, then I can't have a relationship all right, it is foundational, this concept. You have to get it. You have to understand. I want to grant it in your heads. That's what John is saying. God is light. And if we're going to have the joy that John says is possible, that we've seen in other people that we so desperately want to have at times, then we have to understand that God is light. That means he gets to set up the relationship. And we can have fellowship with him. Not only is there a recognition of the light, but also I want you to notice the response to the light. If you would look down at verse number 7, we'll come back to verse number 6 next week, but verse number 7, where John says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. See, John says, now, listen, listen, here's the situation. Walk in the light. I want you to walk in it. You you know that God is now light, and hopefully uh, I've argued effectively from Scripture that God is light. So now John says, so walk in that light. Don't avoid that light. Don't walk around the light, but walk in the light. Walk in it every single day. I see three things, and we've done tonight. First of all, I see this. I see a daily life of following Jesus Christ. This says, first of all, to walk in the light. Not to sprint in the light, but walk in the light. Now, why would the Holy Spirit through John use the word walk instead of run or sprint? There are other times the word run is done, and sprint, they could have figured that out. Maybe it's perhaps because in times past, I've run and I've sprinted and I've walked. I've done all three of those things. Sprinting, there's a, a, a concept that's been out for a few years, an exercise called HIT. Uh, high-intensity training, inter- uh, high-intensity interval training. And in this kind of intensity, high-intensity training, what you do is you, you sprint intervals. And it's great for running. Right, Brother Smith? Increases your increases your, uh, your lung capacity, increases your legs. And, and boy, and, and what you do is you, you run all out for like a minute. When your heart can't take it anymore, all right, then you walk a little bit. Then when you feel like you're about not to die again, you run again until you're about to die. Then you walk, then you about to, then you go get it. It, it is it is awful. Or I tell you right now, it is awful. Whoever thought of this was like part of a torture session and it's somewhere crazy. All right, and like because you will you will confess everything you've ever done wrong at that point. You done with one sprint section. I mean, I, you know, I, I took the Lindbergh bit. I don't know what whatever it is. I'll confess after I sprint. I'm done. In fact, the other morning I, I sprinted. It was before staff meeting. And I got here and uh, and I told the guys I sprinted and I just did not recover as fast as I was hoping to recover. It only took me about an hour. <laughs> I tell you no lie. But, but sometimes Christians sprint. Teenagers, you see this after camp. You're like, yeah, I'm on fire for God. And they take off just running, yeah! And then boom, hit the ground. Right? The Christians, man, look what God's doing. I'm sprinting. Boom, hit the ground. But he says, walk in the light. So tonight, just take a step in the light. Take, take a step. Well, what is that next step? Well, ask God to search your heart. Search me, O oh God, and, and try me, and see if there be any wicked way in me. Oh, the Lord, look at my relationship, and if I need to take another step, then take a step. Walk in the light. Not around the light. Oh, we, we're good at walking around the light. We can talk about the light, too. Oh, I prayed about this, and that's not the will of God. I don't have peace about it. We can talk about the light. But he says, walk in the light. God wants me to do this. When was the last time that, that God moved you to do something and you responded to him? I mean, that, that God touched your heart and he, you're like, you know that God said, hey, you need to do this right here. I was talking to somebody, not another pastor, another church recently, 
And they're talking about how the Lord had touched their heart about how much food they ate. And they said, you know what? We felt the Lord was doing this. They said, don't laugh at me, J.D. I said, I'm not going to laugh at you. Because if God touches your heart, you ought to follow him. And God will touch your heart if you, if you walk in the light. It's a daily walking in the light. Remember, it's about a relationship. It's about touching base with the Lord and saying, Lord, what do you want? This morning we talked about being a living sacrifice, but walk in that light. He says, walk in the light. Are you walking in the light? Do your coworkers know that you walk in the light? Can, can they see that you're taking steps in the light of God's word and his presence? Can they see his spirit coming through you? Walk in the light. Do your kids know, mom and dad, that you're walking in the light? They know that, that you're spending time with God, you're walking there. Does your, does your husband, does your wife know you're walking in the light? Do your grandkids know? Do you, does anyone know you're walking in the light? You know, Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. You see, as we walk in the light, we reflect the light. Others will notice that light. He says to walk, the response to the light, first of all, is a daily walk, a daily life of following Jesus Christ. Talking about Eric and Jackie getting married yesterday. It would be odd, though, if uh, this morning... If Eric came to church without Jackie, we would not say, oh, that's neat. Eric came to church Sunday morning here, and we'd say, hey, Eric, what's wrong? Would we not? Ah, we got married to Jackie. It's no big deal. Yeah. She's going on a honeymoon. I'll catch up to her in a week or so. We'd say, okay, okay, we got some problems here, right? Or would we say that's normal? No, we wouldn't. We'd say, hey, what's going on, man? Get, get with your wife. You see, now that I'm Married, I want to be with my wife. Now that I have fellowship, I want to be with my Lord. Amen. Daily life of following Christ. Not only is it daily life, it's a descriptive life of following Christ. Because John says if you have this fellowship, walk in the light, you'll have fellowship with other Christians. That means that if you do this, you'll be able to walk on the same path with other people. Now John, throughout this book, We'll talk about and command us in aspects of our relationship with other Christians. You say, well, why do we need that? Look around. That's why we need that. You know that, that you may not like everybody in this building? You say, well, why not? You're not walking in the light. The John says, if you walk in the light, you have fellowship one with another. You know, I hope you find your best friends in this room right here or other Christians. That's where your best friends ought to be. How can two walk together except they be agreed? That's what John is saying. If you have fellowship, you'll have fellowship one with another. If you walk in the light, it'll be a descriptive life of following Jesus Christ. Sometimes people will say, well, I don't want to go there. No one wants to be around me. Are you walking in the light? Because John says if you walk in the light, all right, you'll have fellowship one with another. You'll find about verses about that a man that hath friends must show himself friendly, things like that. And so you have a descriptive life. It's been told to me about First Baptist Church, and I'm so thankful for it that we're a friendly church. I told you recently I was at a church, and I, as I pulled up, I, I saw the, the sign there that said, members only. It seemed like a country club, like a, like a, like a boys only club, it seemed like that kind of concept. And here at First Baptist Church, we're glad you're here. We're glad you come on Sunday morning, on a Sunday night, and you know we're glad you show up, and, and you are a very, very friendly church. We welcome people. But it goes beyond just shaking someone's hand at handshaking time. That's not what this fellowship is about. It goes beyond just saying, hey, good to see you. Glad you're in your assigned seat at First Baptist Church. Hope you come back next time. Which, by the way, you ought to start moving around this place, meeting new people, to have fellowship one with another. Put that plug in again for you. In case you missed it a little while ago. It goes beyond just saying, hey, have a nice day. And this word fellowship has the idea of a partnership. You know that you ought to pray for the people around you? Maybe you ought to pray for the people in your section. The ground says you ought to pray for them. And you ought to not only pray for them, you can minister to them. You know that sometimes the most important reason you're here at church may be for someone else. 
may not be for you. Maybe someone with a real need, with a burden in their heart and their life, and when you have fellowship, when you minister and reach out, that you'll touch their heart. God will use you as you walk in the light, and you'll have fellowship one with another. You see, church is just not about coming and sitting. It's not the purpose of church. In the fall or spring, I'm going to do a, a series on, on what God expects from the church. I'll tell you right now, it's not about just coming and sitting Sunday morning, Sunday night. That's not a church. Church is a living, breathing organism. It's the body of Christ. It has a purpose, it has goals. It is a family. That's the church. That's what John is saying. You, have, you walk in the light, you have fellowship one with another. How are you doing? What can I pray for? How can I help you? Something that I do to help me remember is I'll often get prayer requests from people and I, and I would, would covet all of your prayers and prayer requests. I often put it into my phone when that event, if it's an event, is happening to remind me. It's one of the benefits of a smartphone. And then before that happens, it'll buzz me and say, hey, pray for so-and-so at 10 o'clock. They're doing this. And I stop and pray for them. I use my smartphone because I can forget. Have you ever forgotten a prayer request before? They come back and they're like, hey, thanks for praying. What do you say? Oh, fellowship. It's a descriptive life. Not only is it daily descriptive, but it's a distinctive life. Because John says, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Worked on the bus route for a number of years. Go to a home. Go to that home, and as you walk in the home, you'd, you'd notice a few things. You notice that it seemed like the children were neglected a little bit. It seemed like they may not have what they needed to have. You'd meet some of the parents, and often, and we've used this phrase before, you could see a life hardened by sin. You know what I'm talking about? You could see some, some, maybe some lines in the faces where someone has lived for the, themselves and, and maybe taken substances they shouldn't have taken and just lived a hard life, and it seems to be etched in, in their life, in their face even. Yet this verse says that as I follow Jesus Christ in the light and have fellowship one with another, the blood of his son will cleanse us from all sin. That's why I reject this concept of just salvation. This is talking about a daily cleansing that, that says basically as I walk in the light, my life will reflect that light and I'll have a freedom from the burden and the power of sin in my life. That's what we want. We don't want to have constant struggles and constant pain. We want freedom from that. And God says, as you walk in my light, it'll be descriptive. You'll eat lunch with people, as I have. And they'll say, hey, you want a beer? No, no, no. This is what I said. I'm one of those Baptists. Oh. Now I got to explain to this, this person why I didn't drink. A life free from from sin. No, we don't do that. Oh, why? You go to that church? No, because I'm trying to walk in the light. I'm trying to live a life that pleases the Lord. I'm trying to treat my, my family in a way that pleases God, a life free from sin. I'm, I'm not going to go here and watch this and, and drink this or eat this because I'm trying to have a life that pleases God. It's a descriptive life. It doesn't come because I have a rule book in my back pocket where I say, okay, Good Christian number one wears, does, eats, and doesn't do. Put it away. It comes because I'm trying to walk in the light. So the question I have for us tonight is, are you walking in the light? I'm not, I'm not asking if you can identify where the light is at because you all can. Oh, it's right there. That, that's what God wants. I'm not asking if you're walking around the light or talking about the light and, and acting like you walk in the light. I'm asking between you and God, are you walking in in the light. Are you today walking in the light? I know you're in church, but you can be in church and be as far from the light as you can possibly be. And you can be in church and be in the light as well. But are you walking in the light? It happens here. It happens here. We just can't talk about it. Just can't know about it. We have to do it. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your grace. And God, you are light. I'd ask that you would help us to identify and be honest. And 
Lord, you know our hearts. Well, thank you for saving us. I wonder who would say, Pastor Howell, would you pray for me? I know about the light, or I may know where the light's at. Would you pray for me? Because God touched my heart, and maybe there's an area in my life where I've not been walking in the light. Could be my attitude, my spirit. Could be my daily walk. Would you pray for me? I need to walk in the light. Amen. Amen. Would you pray for me, Pastor Howell? Amen. 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 I want to walk in that light. I want that relationship, that joy. Amen. Who else? Amen. 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 I want to walk in that light. Lord, you've seen these hands, and I ask you to help us to be honest before you. Lord, may we walk in your light. Knowing that as we do that, Lord, our relationship is wonderful and our joy is full. In Jesus' name, amen. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, we stand to our feet. Instruments will play. The altar's open.